All right. Today is Monday, August 16th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today, or shall we say a recap for the freak show today. Folks, if you are ever in doubt that this is a Ponzi scheme market, a coked up market, today you were left with no doubt at all at all otherwise you're a zombie you're not even a human being what did we have today in the morning we had the perfect the ideal bear scenario because every single element in the wall of worry was in play in the morning from afghanistan to the shutdowns in china the rise of delta cases in this country and a confirmation of the announcement of the tapering in september by none else than the Fed chairman himself, Papa Jerome Powell. So we have 1 million percent confirmation that the announcement of tapering will happen in September. In addition to all of this chaos, the fallout from Afghanistan, yada, yada, yada. So what do you say? The Dow was down about a thousand points and a minimum, right? S&P 500 down 2%, maybe 2%, 2.5%. NASDAQ down 2, 2.5%, 3%. Nope. What actually happened is... The market closed at all time highs, record highs. Bad news is good news for the market once again. And the market decided to channel its inner Taylor Swift and shake it off, shake off all the worries and the concerns and actually twist them into being a, a positive factor for the market. Folks, we've been saying that this is a drug addict market and it only cares about the flow of cocaine out of the Federal Reserve and the mania of the sentiment within institutional and retail investors alike who are conditioned to buy every single dip. You see, the market is a drug addict in denial, isolated from every problem in the world. Matter of fact, problems, the bigger they are, the better they are for the stock market. Nuclear war, good. Record highs on the SPY, the S&P 500. Civil wars, even better. Dow to all-time highs. Alien invasion, the best. Even the IWM goes to all-time highs. Asteroid, about to hit the planet and humanity in the planet as we know it. That will be the best thing that ever happened to the stock market. And the reason is, so long as the flow of cocaine continues from the Federal Reserve into the market, injecting the market with drugs every single day, us market participants, institutional and retail alike, are conditioned with this uh, false narrative of safety, that the market will not go down. There is no way the market will go down. I mean, the market went down in the morning and I got messages from you guys saying we're going to buy the dip. And I said, go ahead. Who cares? You buy it right now in the morning, you dump it in the afternoon and you're done. In, out, hello, goodbye. In the morning, the market was actually concerned about all of these worries from Afghanistan to Delta to tapering. And it was confused going from one theme to another. The Qs was at performing in the morning and then the Qs started to underperform. And the SPY, the IWM started to outperform. Matter of fact, the rate sensitive sectors of the market, the likes of regional banks, started to outperform, even though the action in the bond market was all over the place. The market went back and forth, back and forth, debating all of these scenarios. And then it decided there is a fourth scenario. And this scenario is pump everything, buy everything, launch an autopilot zombified program, algorithmic program that will buy everything with no stop at all. And by the way, they do it via the same manipulation tactics. That we have discussed before. The easiest way for hedge funds and the large institutional investing firms, if you want to pump the SPY, the Qs, the market in general, the Dow Jones, what is the best play to pump here? Because you want to do it with the least amount of money spent. You don't want to go ahead and buy the SPY, the Qs, the IWM, and a bunch of other stocks costing you billions and billions of dollars to pump the market for one day. You want to do it as efficiently as you can. The best way to pump the market is buy a ton of call options on Apple and create a gamma squeeze and this will lift all of the indices alike. The reason is Apple has a large weighting in the Dow Jones. It has the largest weighting in the SPY and the NASDAQ. 
the triple Qs. I will show you in the options market that Apple was the outlier. The options volume in general in the market was down. The outlier was Apple. Millions and millions and millions of contracts were traded today. The majority of them were calls for the purpose of rescuing and propping up the stock market. And they indeed succeeded in doing that. But let's go in details here in focus tonight and discuss the wall of worry. We have the disaster over in Afghanistan. Absolute shit show. Nothing short of a political disaster. A tragedy. And then we have the cases of Delta and the shutdowns in China. And perhaps most importantly for the market, the tapering. The certainty of tapering. Now, let's start with Afghanistan. How did this shit show start to begin with? And we're not talking about going back 20 years ago. We're talking about a month ago when the President of the United States said this. Is the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan now inevitable? No, it is not. Because you have the Afghan troops have 300,000 well equipped, as well equipped as any army in the world and an air force. So Uncle Joe says, no, it's not inevitable. We have strong security forces over there. They're capable of defending the country, yada, yada, yada. Fast forward about a month later, and this happened. Hey, Becky. Well, there are scenes of panic and pandemonium at Kabul airport today as desperate people pour onto the runway, trying to flee the country in what can only be described as a chaotic exodus. Now, people are literally clinging on to U.S. military aircrafts as they try to take off. There are also reports that NBC News can't confirm that five people have been killed at the airport. It's unclear under what circumstances. Could have been gunfire. It could have been a stampede. But it's so chaotic there. Uh, the details are only dripping out uh, as the day unfolds. Ali, we, we have watched that video of, of the Afghan citizens kind of surrounding the, the military transport plane and, and trying to grasp onto the sides of that. We've watched that again and again um, this morning. And, and I just wonder, what happened? Do you know what the end result was? I mean, the plane can't take off like this. Did they pull it aside? No, uh, one of the planes actually took off and there was also some very disturbing uh, video that's emerged of people uh, falling out of the, the, the wheel hub of the airplane after it had taken off. But most of the planes were grounded because they simply couldn't take off because there was a stampede of people on the runway, literally, as the video showed, clinging onto the plane. So a lot of them had to be grounded. And then the U.S. Army then had to uh, form a perimeter around the runway to stop people coming, uh, pouring onto the runway, and they had to fire warning shots in the air to disperse people. So Absolute disaster. Let me ask you a question here. Do you think that anybody, anybody in future conflicts will ever trust the United States of America? Of course not. Zero. Zero trust. If you trust the United States and you risk your life to help the United States, America will abandon you at the end of the day. Not our problem, folks. We're done here. Goodbye. And good luck, by the way. And after this uh, disaster unfolded, the President of the United States, Joe Biden, gave a speech today. After hiding all weekend, by the way. He gave a speech, and this is what he said. I always promise the American people that I will be straight with you. The truth is, this did unfold more quickly than we had anticipated. So what's happened? Afghanistan political leaders gave up and fled the country. The Afghan military collapsed, sometime without trying to fight. If anything, the developments of the past week reinforced that ending U.S. military involvement in Afghanistan now was the right decision. American troops cannot and should not be fighting in a war and dying in a war that Afghan forces are not willing to fight for themselves. We spent over a trillion dollars. We trained and equipped an Afghan military force of some 300,000 strong, incredibly well equipped, a force larger in size than the militaries of many of our NATO allies. We gave them every tool they could need. We paid their salaries, provided for the maintenance of their air force, Something the Taliban doesn't have. Taliban does not have an Air Force. Now, I don't know how the conversation goes in the Pentagon 
the CIA and the so-called national security up Uranus? Do they get the order and say, you know what, the president of the United States says, we gotta move out of Afghanistan. And the generals go, okay, let's call a U-Haul. Is this how it goes? No questions at all? Because even an amateur, a douchebag on YouTube like myself, knows from watching The Godfather 2 that paying money, as Joe Biden says, we paid their salaries, 300,000 soldiers in Afghanistan, that means shit. The moment you pull out, the entire country collapses. Just like if the Fed pulls out of the market, the entire market collapses. Remember that scene from The Godfather 2 when Michael Corleone goes to Cuba to meet Hyman Roth for his birthday. On the way, he sees a bunch of rebels, and one of the rebels decided to explode himself, committing suicide, killing the captain of the military police along with him. And this is what Michael Corleone said. I saw an interesting thing happen today. A rebel was being arrested by the military police. And rather than be taken alive, he exploded a grenade he had hidden in his jacket. He killed himself, and he took a captain of the command with him. Right, Johnny? Those rebels, you know, they're lunatics. Maybe so. But it occurred to me, the soldiers are paid to fight. The rebels aren't. What does that tell you? They can win. Now, nobody, nobody in the Pentagon CIA, national security up Uranus, nobody said to Mr. Biden, perhaps you want to watch The Godfather 2 to understand that pulling out of Afghanistan means that the entire country will collapse in a second the moment we pull out. Now we can go back and forth and talk about whether it was justified to begin with to be in that country or not, but here's my take. I fix cars as a hobby, and even if you maintain your cars, you know this, if you fail to change your transmission fluid, let's say the car has over 200,000 miles, if you decide to change the transmission fluid at that point, you're actually going to damage your transmission. And the reason is, in the duration of driving the car for over 200,000 miles and not changing the transmission fluid, it has now became too thick like a tar, and the gears became conditioned to the thickness of the fluid. When you take that fluid out and you replace it with new fluid, which is much lighter because it's newer, you're going to find out that your transmission is starting to slip. This is how I see the situation in Afghanistan. Perhaps it was a mistake to begin with, but now that we're in, when you pull out abruptly, you're going to cause a major problem. And once again, I'm just a douchebag on YouTube. I'm not a national security expert. I'm not a general, I'm not an advisor, but all of these geniuses somehow missed on all of this. Now, you might be asking yourself a question. What is the importance of Afghanistan to the market? Who cares about Afghanistan? The market doesn't care. The market cares about the coke. You're right, but there are ramifications here. Number one, the confidence, the global confidence of the leadership of the United States of America. This will have an impact, a negative one, on the currency and on U.S. bonds. If you have a country pulling out like this, abandoning its allies and the people who sacrificed their lives to help the mission, can you have faith in this country at all? Number two, the consequences. We're talking about the political consequences on the Biden administration. He came out today being defiant giving a speech, saying, hey, I'm not, I don't have apologies here. I'm not going to apologize about anything. We did the right thing. If you don't want to see how the sausage is made, stay the hell away from the kitchen. Okay. But... The situation will continue to unfold in the next coming days and months. Lots of unexpected events could happen, perhaps being dragged into war once again. Perhaps images of the Taliban abusing and committing atrocities against women in that country. By the way, are Hollywood celebrities tweeting anything in support of Afghani women? Or are they keeping quiet because it makes their cult leader looks bad? This is the state of politics in America, by the way. Let go of your own rationale, of your own reason, of your own principles and morals in support of your cult, whether you are in the blue cult or the red cult. And this is what's dragging this country to hell, by the way. A lot of you say you talk about uh, you talk about the problems, Maverick. You're good about talking about the problems, but you never talk about the solutions. Here's the solution. Pull your head out of your ass. Simple. You don't need tools to do that. Just a little tug, you know, pull it. If every American pulls their heads out of their asses and gets some fresh air, at least for the moment, and realize that this partisan politics, these cults, is what's destroying the country. Because when we join these cults, blue or red, we forego our rationale, reason, morality, 
principles and we find ourselves defending the indefensible back to the wall of worry we talked about afghanistan let's talk about tapering which is perhaps more important and relevant to the market than Afghanistan. Remember the advance warning that Jerome Powell promised us before tapering or reducing the cocaine operation, removing the quote-unquote accommodative policy? He said, rest assured, before the party ends, I will issue an advance warning for you, letting you know in advance we're gonna end the party. Now, you and I know this. This argument is stupid to begin with, because what is advanced warning? Jerome Powell says advanced warning is a fluid situation. It could be defined in many ways, just like we define transitory. But the point is, let's say the advanced warning happens today. Folks, we're going to taper 1 million percent in September. The party is about to end. And oh, by the way, we might have a free market where valuations go back to reasonable levels, aka the market might crash. What do you think will happen? What will happen is everybody will rush to the exit door at the same place, excuse me, at the same time. And it is impossible to fit everybody through a narrow door, one exit door, meaning there will be casualties on the dance floor those who leave early meaning that they get the advance warning the actual advance warning they will leave early they will get away unharmed booking gains and now they have the opportunity to buy the market at the bottom once again who are these people who will get the advance warning is it you and i or is it the wall streeters the hedge funds and the likes i think you can answer this one for yourself the question is, did we just get the advance warning today? Because Jerome Powell himself, the Fed chairman himself, the king of doves, now saying that in September, we will announce a tapering plan. We have the FOMC minutes on Wednesday, but was today the advance warning? Perhaps you saw Steve Leisman over and over and over and over again on CNBC. Why do you think that happened, by the way? It is done by design. This is your advance warning, because when the announcement actually happens, the market will crash right away. You're not going to have any time to fit through a narrow door or everybody's stampeding to fit through the same door. Now, on Wednesday, if he says that in September we will announce for sure 100% the tapering plan, then the market will start to weaken at that moment right away because the market, remember, it looks forward. But rest assured, the zombified institutional and retail investor alike took the advance warning and said, okay, that's nice. Let's buy the dip. And the SPY closed at the highs of the day. The Dow Jones, the Nasdaq, all closing at the highs of the day. Meaning that even after the advance warning, the announcement is already here. Folks, we're about to end the party. The dance floor is about to catch on fire. Please proceed to the exit door. Us dummies, the retail traders and the like, we say, you know what? I think he's bluffing. DJ Powell is bluffing. Let's double down put our blindfolds on, and dance a little more. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, the Taylor Swift market. Shake it off. Just shake it off. Everything is going to be all right. No problem whatsoever. Which leads us to the wall of worry. Let's talk about Delta and China. Cases are soaring across the country, even though the country is about 80% vaccinated, which opens the possibility of another booster shot. And by the way, the dear media says, don't call them booster shots. Ah, don't do that. Follow the book, the propaganda book from our deal leaders. It's not a booster shot. It's a third dose. And then we're going to have the fourth dose, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, and infinity and beyond. Now, is Delta a problem for the market? I always held the belief that it is not. It is not. The reason is the vaccinations prevent severe illness, hospitalization, and therefore preventing any economic shutdowns. The leading indicator, I told you, is the United Kingdom. Cases peaked, they went down, yet the number of fatalities barely went higher. Had a little mini pop and it went down right away, meaning that the impact of Delta is perhaps contained, at least in this country. The problem of Delta is in aging countries countries with low vaccination rates, countries with, uh, shall we say, Fugazi vaccines. That will get me in more trouble, by the way, in China, not here. You can't question these vaccines, the ones here and the ones in China. But the consequences in China are a lot bigger. 
shall we say. Here you can lose your job. No biggie. You can get fired from CNN. No problem. You cannot collect employment benefits. Unemployment benefits, excuse me. But in China, you might be uh, sleeping with the fishes if you question the efficacy of the vaccine. And in China, they have the Chinese vaccine. Perhaps the Chinese vaccine is not that effective at all. And therefore, we're having a problem in China. Of course, the CCP will never reveal the true nature of the problem. But actions speak louder than words. They're shutting economies over there. They're shutting ports. Most importantly, ports are being shut down. We already have a shipping crisis and the shutdowns of ports in China adding more fuel to the fire. Shipping costs soaring off the charts. And now ships are being docked in the port of Los Angeles, Long Beach, for longer and longer and longer. The wait time is about to exceed the height of the crisis a few months ago. And that leads us once again to the debate of the data. We have data supporting inflation. We have an inflation problem, perhaps a stagflation problem. There is another set of data supporting perhaps deflation, even though I continue to tell you, even economists, so-called experts face a major problem because they fail to distinguish, shall we say, distinguish between growth and inflation. Growth could go down, spending could go down, but if prices linger higher, this is called stagflation. But for now, let's entertain the two camps, the camps of inflation and the camp of deflation. The camp of inflation has the PPI, the CPI, and the employment report, the non-farm payroll report all indicating to higher inflation. On the other hand, the deflation side, they have the ADP report, for example, which came out way below expectations. They have the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index, which we talked about in last night's video. Total disaster. To me, the guy you're listening to right now, I don't see the difference here. Both set of data support my theory of stagflation. But for now, the bond market is distinguishing between the two sets of data, the inflation side and the deflation side. We're going to get more data in this week. We already got more data. We got the Empire State, the Empire State Index, and we'll talk about the results in the conclusion of this video. But we have retail sales coming out tomorrow. This will be even more important than the Empire State. So we're going to go back to the debate between inflation, disinflation, and the bond market dilemma once again. But the wall of worry, the problem in China, certainly supports the inflation side as shipping costs soar across the board. But this is how we're going to go through the data this week. Does it support inflation? Does it support deflation? And does that even have any impact on tapering whatsoever? Because for now, it seems like the Fed is already determined that inflation is going out of whack and they should be announcing tapering in September. But we know if the market starts to fall, throwing a tantrum, they're going to go ahead and delay the tapering announcement. And the reason is Delta, China, Afghanistan, Bolivia, doesn't matter. They're going to find an excuse to delay tapering. And perhaps this is what's meriting the market's action today. Market participants calling the Fed's bluff, saying you're not going to taper. We have more problems now, and we're going to buy the dip anyways. Will they prove it right? Will they prove it wrong? Who knows? All I know is that while the market rebounded significantly higher, off the lows, closing at the highs of the day, the internals of the market were actually weak today. Extremely weak. That leads us to the market performance today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green by 110.2 points, or a gain of 0.31%. The Nasdaq closing in the red down 29.13 points or a decline of 0.20%. The SPY, the S&P 500 up closing in the green by 11.71 points or a gain of 0.26%. What about the sector's performance today? Leading the pack at number one and capturing the gold medal. Utilities at number two for the silver. Healthcare at number three for the bronze defensives. This is an extreme defensive theme in the market today. Chasing yields. We'll talk in the heat map analysis. Meanwhile, the laggards of the day led by the offensive sectors of the market the inflationary sectors of the market, energy, materials, and consumer cyclicals. So again, folks, while the indices closed in the green, 
pay attention here. The theme within the market was extremely defensive. Here's another set of data for you. The internals of the market. NYSE, 32% advancing versus 66% declining. The NASDAQ, 29% advancing versus 69% declining. Awful breadth here, meaning we don't have a confirmation of the action we got in the market today. The action in the charts was ahead of Coke to prop up the market higher via buying Apple. But the internals of the market remain extremely weak. Moving on to futures. All eyes were in crude oil. The WTI and crude oil Brent. The reason is, A. Are we about to have another conflict in Afghanistan? B. The ramifications on the Biden administration. Remember, a resignation, an impeachment of sorts, of Joe Biden will be bad for the energy sector of the market. Joe Biden is the best thing that ever happened to big oil. And the reason is, he shut down the domestic supply entirely. And therefore, oil prices have risen higher. If Biden is out of the picture, now, the assumption is Kamala will take over and Kamala is not gonna allow fracking and shale oil to produce again so either way it's gonna be good for these big oil producers and crude oil prices in general but putting my political hat here if the images we saw today from Afghanistan were to cost the Democrats seats in Congress and the Senate in the upcoming midterm elections, then perhaps regardless of the executive branch of the government, say Republicans take over the Senate, then perhaps we'll see friendlier policies toward fracking, shale oil production, and this will add pressure on crude oil prices. But for today, the blow was contained. The WTI was about one and a half percent in the downside along with crude oil brent not a big deal at all what about softs sugar remains sweet leading the pack here meanwhile the pain in lumber goes on and on and on can we get zero for lumber please let's go down to zero perhaps the wall street betters can uh, squeeze the shorts and stick it to the wall streeters and pump lumber higher initiating a short squeeze we will see but lumber down big about six percent today what about metals Gold and silver at performing today. The US dollar going all over the place. A little bit of weakness here, helping gold and silver. Meanwhile, copper is down. Now, understand this. Copper goes higher if the market is picking the inflation theme where financials, industrials, energy, materials manage to outperform in the market. Meanwhile, gold and silver tend to outperform along with technology. So in days when we have the deflation trade of technology growth and momentum, gold tends to outperform. Today, the outperformer lifting the market single-handedly is the stock of Apple. And gold followed the footsteps of Apple by trading higher. What about meats? Lean hogs, the new big tech, rallying, surging higher by about 3% or so. What about grains? Leading the gains, canola, oats and soybean meal futures meanwhile leading the losses corn and soybean oil futures Moving on to the big casino, the options market. Let's see what's going on here. They had a stable in the market, as we discussed before. Apple, the outlier, noticed that the options volume for Tesla, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, the banks, none of these options were elevated today in terms of volume. But magically, the options volume for Apple went higher. Let me ask you a question. You think I was born yesterday and I don't understand market manipulation? I know what you're going to say. Apple is trading higher. People are buying call options because uh, Apple announced new uh, colors for the upcoming iPhones, bro. Or perhaps certain uh, entity, quote-unquote entity, decided to prop up the market by the most efficient way via buying call options on Apple. Apple at number one with 2 million contracts traded today. About 75% of those were calls. At number two, Petrobras, PBR, Brazilian oil company. With 800,000 contracts, about 97% of those were calls. This is usually a contrarian indicator, meaning that the stock will go down, not up, as people sell calls. The holders of the stock sell calls. What about Tesla, the souffle, at number three? Oh, we got a big problem here with the souffle. We'll talk in the charts. But for now, about half a million contracts traded for the souffle today. About 56% of those were calls. What about the unusual activities in the options market today? Lots of gambling. 
insane amount of gambling. Notice the short scope for all of these trades. They're expiring this upcoming Friday. There is no vision at all. We can't see the market's direction a week from now. This is how uncertain the environment is with lack of clarity. Are they going to taper? Are they not going to taper? Is Delta a problem? Is it not a problem? Is the consumer slowing down? Is it not slowing down? Are prices going higher? Or are they not going higher? And therefore, market participants are rolling the dice and playing the game. Let's start with the ticker AMC for, you guessed it, AMC. They bought the 40 bucks calls, expiration date this upcoming Friday, August 20th, with the expectations that the name will rise by over 12% by then. They paid about 65 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about two and a half million dollars. What about the trade for the ticker APPL, Apple? They bought the 160 calls, expiration date September 17th, with the expectations that the name will rally by over 6% by then. They paid about a buck and 20 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about two and a half million dollars. What about the trades for the ticker AMD for, you guessed it, AMD. This is a call spread. They bought the 115 calls and they sold the 112, excuse me, the 120. So this is more intelligent than other wild shot gambling trades because you're reducing your entry cost as much as possible and therefore you're reducing your risk in case the trade goes the other way the expiration date for this trade is this upcoming friday august 20th now they paid 55 cents a piece almost for the 115 leg and they collected 25 cents a piece for the 120 leg that they sold. All in all, the entry cost is 30 cents a piece, which brings the total to about $600,000. What about the ticker RIOT? This is a riot tulip chain. It's a proxy for Bitcoin. They're making a bullish bet here by buying the 38 calls, expiration date August 20th, meaning this upcoming Friday, once again, with the expectations that the name will rise by over 6% by then. They paid about a buck and 15 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about two million dollars what about the trade for the ticker b e k e this is some chinese garbage they're buying puts this time around the 15 puts with the expiration date of september 17th with the expectations that the name will drop by over 15 percent by then they paid about one buck a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about one and a half million dollars what about the trade for the ticker MRNA, Moderna? The name got whacked since the top, but perhaps we're about to rebound here, at least according to this trade. They bought the 400 calls, expiration date August 20th, with the expectations that Moderna will rally by over 7% by then. They paid about four bucks a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about $6 million. No biggie. What about the ticker EXPE? Expedia. They're buying the 155 calls, expiration date September 17th. The expectations that the name will rally by over 7.5% by then. They paid about 2 bucks and 30 cents a piece to enter this trade. All in all, spending about 3.5 million dollars. Lastly, what about the trade for the ticker TSLA, the souffle? They bought the 650 puts, the expiration date of this upcoming Friday. August 20th, with the expectations that Tesla will drop by over 5% by then. They paid about four bucks a piece to enter this trade. All in all, bringing the total to about six million dollars. They're gambling left and right with a massive amount of money. Welcome to the casino. Moving on to the heat map analysis right away. The weakness is evident in the market. You look at the closing, the Dow closing in the green, the SPY closing in the green, but once again, the, inter the internals not so hot. So Apple rising higher by over 1%. That was good enough to rally the Dow, the SPY, and even muff the drop in the Nasdaq. Now, what was working today? The dividend paying names aka the extreme safety we're talking about utilities we're talking about REITs we're talking about defensives names like PepsiCo Procter and Gamble Coca-Cola Kroger etc we have healthcare another corner of safety big pharma stocks Merck Eli Lilly Bristol Myers AbbVie stock that I own all rising higher these are all dividend 
paying stocks. Likewise, we have industrials. Certain names like UPS, Triple M, Honeywell, even the defense contractors like LMT, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, all rising higher. These are all dividend paying stocks. Now we have financials and energy. These are all dividend paying stocks, but they're not outperforming. And the reason is financials are tied to the yield curve. And when yields are muted, they trade down specifically on the longer end of the yield curve. This is bad for financials. Likewise, energy, energy stocks in this case, are tied up to the price of crude oil. Crude oil is going down. And the reason is the Delta shutdowns in China, perhaps some political turmoil for the Biden administration and therefore energy stocks are underperforming. Moving on to charts, starting with the SPY 30 minutes chart. And this is laughable. I don't know if this is a meme or a real chart. This is the most hilarious chart I've ever seen in my life. Look at the action today. A drop touching 443. This is the new support level, by the way. And rebounding with no stop in sight at all. An autopilot zombified algorithmic program with no stop at all. Buying, buying, buying all the way till the end of the day. And the main question is who unleashed the buying program? It is so-called the mysterious entity that we talk about from time to time. Even the hypermania perma bulls. Looking at this chart right now, you cannot say that this is normal. This is garbage. You bookmark this chart right now and save it. When the bubble is over, when you're teaching a course in college, you show people this chart. This was a massive warning signal that this is a coked up market and at some point it will suffer a major withdrawal. For now, the party goes on. Massive rebound closing the gap, closing at all time highs. It's like we got the best news for the market today. The apocalypse was good for the market. And by the way, let's zoom out a little bit here. Shall we call this uh, bear trap number four? I'm just going to call it V-shape recovery number two. Here it is. Daily chart, continuous contract of this PY. Any problem here? Not at all trading at all-time highs, broke over the consolidation range. The RSI is positive once again. The MACD indicator is positive once again. No problems at all. Could it be a bull trap? Yes, it could. But from the technical perspective alone, you have zero signs that this is a bull trap. To figure out whether this is a bull trap or not, you have to find out who was behind the algorithmic program of buying today. What is their end goal? Was it a short-term goal? Were they losing on options and now they're not losing and they closed the positions and they booked profits and therefore the action today is going to be pump and dump? Who knows? Unless you have that fact in hand, you cannot call it a bull trap. What about the Qs? 30 minutes chart what's going on here slipping below the trading channel whoops and then rebounding higher with another v-shape recovery market goes down a little bump of coke little hit back in business daily chart continuous contract with the nasdaq is there anything to see here not at all trading above the last support of 15,000, but the negative divergences on the RSI and the MACD indicators persist. So the SPY looking a lot better than the Qs. Now, can we read anything beside the technicals here? The technicals, no problem at all. There are some warning signals here with the negative divergences, but the candlestick pattern alone looks okay. Bullish consolidation awaiting the break out of the range higher. But if we play the psychology, for example, the action today, the massive rebound, the V-shaped recovery was a display of resiliency and a display that the appetite of risk remains alive. The problem is who was behind the buying? Was it really retail? If it was retail, then I would say, okay, the market shows, showed a lot of resiliency and the market will trade higher from this point on. But if that quote unquote somebody who initiated the buying program already achieved their purposes, that we cannot read anything regarding the psychology today because we have no clue who was behind the buying program. IWM, what's going on here? Small caps, 30 minutes chart. Going back all the way to the support of 218 and bouncing higher. Still trading within range. Nothing wrong with this chart at all. IWM was underperforming in the morning as the market was debating, should I follow Delta? Should I follow Afghanistan? Should I follow the tapering announcement? And it went back and forth, back and forth. But all in all, the IWM closed well above the lows because the market decided let's rally everything together. When in doubt, when you have uncertainty, push everything higher. This market feels like a dark comedy, by the way. Dixie, dollar index, what's going on here? 
losing some momentum not a lot but it's starting to become noticeable here of course the market has to weigh in tapering because tapering will push the us dollar higher the market has to weigh in the sentiment and the risk appetite specifically out of asia because the asian investor has been resorting to the safety quote-unquote safety of the us dollar and us bonds but now we're seeing tulips rallying higher we're seeing us stocks rallying higher so at some point the asian investor will have to weigh in their choices do you continue to go with the safety of the us dollar and bonds or go risk on buying U.S. equities and perhaps cryptos. For now, the technical outlook for the U.S. dollar remains bullish, but it is up for grabs. The reason is, you could argue that we are seeing the formation of a cup and handle, which will push the U.S. dollar higher, above 93. But you could also argue that we have a double top at 93, and the Dixie will flush down. For me, I have to anticipate the FOMC meeting on Wednesday. This will be the day where the US dollar will make its move one way or the other, breaking above 93 or breaking below 92. And of course, the movement of the Dixie will have implications for commodities and equities alike. For example, gold, for now gold is having a good time, rebounding higher, and the destination is 1800. We should face some resistance at 1800, but the ultimate destination around 1830, this will be the Fibonacci retracement level. Once again, gold has three enemies. Number one, the Dixie. Number two, yields. Number three, BTC. All of these enemies of gold, the Dixie, BTC, and yields taking a break a little bit of weakness here and therefore paving the way for gold to continue to rebound higher and here it is the chart of yields the 10-year treasury the number is 1.28 percent we're trading below that number for now yields went all over the place up and down as the market debates and digests the elements of the wall of worry for now it looks like if the market decides to go with the tapering yields will pop higher and finally breaking above the descending line the slope of resistance if that happened the tlt will go down for now this is a weekly chart for the tlt neutral nothing is going on here trading at the support level of 149 we need to see a break one way or the other away from 149 up or down this will give us the confirmation of which side will win the argument yields going higher supporting inflation and tapering or the tlt going higher popping higher supporting a slow down in the economy and perhaps a delay in tapering kicking the can down the road this is what the market is bidding on by the way the market is saying the fed is bluffing they're not going to announce tapering in september so powell says i'm going to give you guys an advance warning he gives the advance warning and we decide not to listen. We say, pal, you're lying, bitch. You're lying. I'm going to put my blindfolds on. I'm going to continue to dance. I'm going to continue to gamble. And I'm going to buy the dip. Okay. Here's perhaps the most important chart for the day. Apple, my leading indicator, breaking above 150, meaning out of range. This is an important breakout. And the reason is it is an indicator, at least for now. If you decide not to look at the manipulation side of using Apple call options to risk rescue the market if you look at this chart on its own no context at all this is a bullish breakout indicating more gains for apple and if that is the case then the nasdaq will outperform if the nasdaq outperform what does that mean it means the tlt will outperform it means gold will outperform it means the dixie will go down inflation expectations will go down tapering expectations will go down so is apple the canary in a coal mine predicting that tapering will not happen and the ad performer the winner from all of this debate and all of this argument will be you know what the economy will slow down the pace of growth will slow down yields will go down oh and by the way the fed doesn't need to taper for now and therefore here we go again let's party and buy big cap technology stocks growth and momentum speaking of growth and momentum and perhaps the devil's advocate to the chart of apple here is tsla tesla the souffle the chart looked pretty good from a technical perspective it was a bullish consolidation grinding its way over and over and over again at around 720 a classic behavior charting behavior that we have a pop imminent above 720 but you always have to combine the technicals with the fundamentals anybody who tells you otherwise all oh, the technicals are the only thing that matters bullshit the fundamentals matter too they move stocks and in this case we had a triple whammy with a souffle 
causing the massive meltdown all the way to the support of 6 79. What is the triple whammy, by the way? Number one, the sell off early in the morning. This is whammy number one. Whammy number two, we now have an investigation about the autopilot program in Tesla. The autopilot feature, excuse me, investigating all of these crashes where magically Tesla happens to crash and collide with police vehicles, fire department vehicles. What's going on here? And this is all happening, by the way, right before the so called AI day for the Culties. The cultists say that Tesla is not overvalued. The valuation of Tesla is reasonable at about $700 billion because it is the future, bro. Uh, the robo-taxis. Don't forget about those. Yeah, where are the robo-taxis? Been waiting and waiting for robo-taxis. Where are the damn robo-taxis? Perhaps Tesla deserves the premium of $700 billion for a... Uh, WMD optimism, since the soufflés are becoming weapons of mass destruction, exploding all over the place, and when you see one of these fires, the Tesla fires, they require an enormous amount of water to put down. Rumor has it, soufflé fires are responsible for the drought crisis in California. But whammy number three today was the announcement, the revelation from the big short Michael Burry, who announced, he didn't announce, he filed. And we now know that Michael Burry, the big short, is shorting ARK Invest, the RKK, also known as Tesla Witch Kathy Wood ETF, which includes Tesla as the major component. Now, I don't understand this move by Burry. You already short Tesla. Why would you commit redundancy and short the RKK? K -K -K -K? Perhaps he has a reason. I don't know what it is. But he is using put options, by the way, which is a little risky. But it shows that shorting in this market is even more risky. You're better off buying put options as the shorting mechanism. If you lose those premiums, it's done. It's over. You lost the premiums. That was your risk, and it's gone. But shorting the stock, your losses can be unlimited. And you're seeing shorts pretty much abandoning the practice altogether. In the meme stock era, in the Wall Street bets era, nobody wants to short stocks. They're shorting via put options. Anyhow, the announcement from Burry also impacted Tesla shares to trade down. So triple whammy, for now the support is 679. I had an intraday trade for Tesla. I bought the 700 calls right at the point when Tesla rebounded off 679. So I was eyeing 679 as support. Once that level is reached, was reached, and the souffle rebounded, I bought the 700 calls and I sold them by the end of the day for a whopping 13% gain. I did not have the balls to hold these call options any longer than that. But about the VIX, what's going on here? Four hours chart. A massive pop higher, considerably. Notice that the SPY, the NASDAQ, excuse me, the SPY and the Dow Jones trading higher, closing in the green today. But the VIX also trading higher and closing in the green. So we don't have a confirmation here. The action we saw in the market today is sustainable. If we look at the MACD indicator from a four hours perspective in the VIX's chart, perhaps the pop is not over yet. Perhaps the pop is just starting. If that is the case, the gains we saw in this PY today will reverse as the VIX rallies higher one more time. BTC, what's going on here? You look at the momentum indicators. We have the dome, the saucer topping in the RSI. We have an exhaustion of the momentum from the MACD indicator. We're about to have a crossing creating negative impressions on the histogram. If that is the case, it doesn't mean that BTC will go down or crash or anything like that. But it means that this momentum, this push higher, is coming to an end. And now the stock could consolidate, even go down a little bit, perhaps retouch the 42,000 level before bouncing higher. Now, I still believe that BTC has what it takes to go all the way to 50,000 before reversing down. But if you want to be conservative, if you already made profits trading this chart, at any point, right after the rescue operation by Dorsey, Musk, and Wood, you might want to consider taking profits here and not be greedy all the way to 50,000 because there are no guarantees that BTC will trade at 50,000. The momentum is stopping here, so watch out for this one. AMC, what's going on here? AMC popping higher, and I issued this tweet. As the market was selling off in the morning, then I'm moving my capital to the safety of AMC. I wasn't joking, by the way. We have a consistent theme here. When we have a sell-off in the market, the SPY, the Qs, meme stocks tend to outperform. And you saw that today as well. GameStop, AMC were trading higher, much higher 
Matter of fact, as the SPY was melting down, AMC was melting higher. What is the reason behind that? Who knows? But it has been a pattern. Good day for AMC trading above 32 by a lot. We're now at almost 35 and a half. We'll see how far this pop will go. We talked about the contrast between the daily chart and the weekly chart. The daily chart remains bullish for now. The weekly charts remain bearish for now. What does that mean? In the short term, you can ride this one higher. But you got to be careful because the longer term charts are suggesting that the momentum in AMC has already topped about a week or two ago. Now, let's move on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar? Tomorrow, we have retail sales. This is the most important number on the set of data we're about to receive tomorrow. I also see Fed Chair Jerome Powell takes questions from students. Can we pretend to be students and ask the son of a bitch some real questions? We also have propagandists Neil Kashkari speaking. Who cares? Perhaps to an audience of lizards, not students. But let's talk about the data we got today from the Empire Manufacturing Index. The headline number was down. And therefore, the deflationary camp, the transitory camp, was caught jerking off big time today. The problem is, as always, the devil is in the details. Here it is. Delivery times continued to lengthen substantially, okay? Here's perhaps the most important piece. Both price indices remained at or near record highs. The prices paid index held steady at 76.1, while the prices received index climbed 7 points to 46, setting a new record. Again, is this inflationary or deflationary i say stagflationary prices continue to go higher meanwhile the headline number economic activities are going down anyhow folks i'm topped out here that's all i got for you for now but i will talk to you again tomorrow if you found the information presented in this video helpful please subscribe press the like button the notification button and follow me on social media